everyone. GP here. Um, without my normal mug, I've got a thermos because I was going to do this uh, sitting outside, but I, I, I ran out of time and I got a bunch of meetings, so I'm getting it done now. It was a question that um, my attention was drawn to by one of the administrators of the private group from Chennai, and um, I thought I would uh, give it an answer uh, because it's, a, it, it's important. Um, sometimes I decide to make videos when the subject's got a little bit more meat in it, um, rather than just like, you know, even a paragraph of, of text as an answer. And this was one of those, uh, because of the enormous amount of interest in, in something that will give us a sense of stability and, and, and hope for the future. Um, so the question is this, what do you make of the Lionsgate portal? Is this astro astrologically significant? Do you take time to manifest and set intentions of this day? I always feel weird about New Age spirituality. <laughs> and rightly so. Well, truthfully, you mentioned it. I had to go look it up. I didn't know what it was. I'm, I'm not an uh, astrologer. And, and, and is it astrologically significant? Um, to astrologers, I think it is. Now, I should tell you, and this is an interesting thing. Let me talk a little bit about astrology before I go into the kind of the whole new age vibe. <clears throat> um, I was married to a world-class astrology astrologist for a while. Um, she was from Buenos Aires, had her own TV show, was extremely well-known, so well-known, in fact, two of the presidents of her country consulted with her while they were in office. <laughs> Actually summoned the, you know, their version of the White House where she came. Another time she, um, she had to go see her nieces, so she refused and the president of the country came to her. She, it was literally sitting on the floor in a room because she had a kind of interesting looking room. Um, so obviously credible. We had talks about it, uh, uh, obviously, because I'm not an astrologer, and I, but and and and, and she agreed with my uh, approach on it, and she gave me some insights into what it meant, at least for her. Now, having watched her for many years, she was never wrong. I mean, she she nailed everything to a T. She could look at somebody's chart and describe their whole life. In fact, she even told me about my uh, my oldest brother. Who was who uh, died at birth uh, when my uh, uh, when my mother and father were first married? He was older than my sister. He was thirteen years older. He would have been about fifteen years older than me. Um, she told me about him and various other things that I'd completely forgotten about. Okay. So for her, she developed this whole system that she called Jungian, where she used the various astrological signs as archetypes. Uh, like I use the chakras, she was using those as archetypes of consciousness. So things represented the conscious, the unconscious, various patterns, all sorts of, uh, all sorts of things like that. But the most interesting part about it is, is to her, um, she stopped doing uh, readings and stuff like that because she got just tired of everybody wanting to tell her, her to tell them how to lead their lives. But she made a very ob observation that it was reflective. Astrology was reflected if it was not causative. The idea that the bunch of planets are going to go open up, so there's going to be a whole much more opportunities, is inaccurate. That that when you're born to her, that when you're born, your story, your karmic story, is written in the stars. The position of the stars uh, indicate the your karmic story. Now, of course, the mind can connect dots to anything, right? And you, know, you take all of this stuff with a grain of, a grain of salt. She, must, she may have been just so remarkably perceptive. In a lot of ways, she'd look at the chart and then she'd never look back. She had another friend of hers who read palms. It was the same deal. She'd look at the palm and then she'd never look back at it. It was completely intuitive after that. But at any rate, she said it, it isn't causing things to happen. It is simply a picture. And she said, I can quite accurately predict 
what happened and what's going to happen in a person's life. Down to the T. As a matter of fact, the name of her TV show was, um, was Destiny or Freedom. <laughs> she, I can predict it down to just down to a gnat's ass. <clears throat> Unless the person has started to become conscious. So when that happens, all bets are off. That this is a map of what will happen if the karmic cycles just keep going. If nothing inter and nothing comes in to basically sw flip the script, and that th something that comes in is consciousness, self-awareness. The moment I realize, and you know, our experience of conditioning in a life is nothing other than and the instance of the, the large-scale karmic conditioning, you might call. It's the momentum of events, right? Which will continue right? Uh, until they're seen. Like the conditioning in your life will dictate. You can accurately predict how people are going to behave until they become aware of their own behavior. Until something wakes up and goes, whoa, I'm just acting out of this programmed response. I'm little more than a robot or a, or a trained puppy, right? But when that consciousness dawns, everything changes. Because now you're aware of that. And the very act of being aware of it means you've taken a step out of it. So the answer, of course, is always consciousness. Now, to speak to the other part of it, just the whole New Age spirituality and like, you should feel weird about it. It's, it's not hard to understand, right? We've, we came out of, you know, a couple thousand years, a long time, what, 1,500 years, the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, finally into the Renaissance. All of that was still strictly and and forcefully controlled by the church and superstition and belief in ignorance, right? Along comes the enlightenment, right? The, the age of reason, well, for the West, it's all, it was already gone on in Persia and India and everywhere else. The arrogance of the West think, oh, we for the first, no, we weren't, we were the last. <laughs> Nonetheless, <clears throat> just because of the brutality and the stupidity of the, of the church. Um, when the when that kind of grip hold uh, got lost, first the Roman Catholic Church, which then split into the Protestants, which then kept splitting even more, right? Uh, plus the rise of, of of science and and the and the and the uh, superiority of reason and logic, right? You you had this vestibule in which there was going to be a conflict between the new and the old, and so you'd have a lot of people. Uh, so all of a sudden now there was no set foundation that this was it, you know. I mean, even Descartes, you know, one of the, the heroes and, and early guys in the whole enlightenment, you know, thought this is God's doing, right? I mean, God didn't completely be, be completely written out of the script until like the 1920s, right? The 1910s, 19, 1920s, where we now have the kind of materialistic science that we have have now. Right? And, and so many people who leave, leave religion now become atheist, right? So now it is the, well, what we're all engaged in is the search for truth. Right? And when the truth you thought was true falls apart, you start to look elsewhere. We cannot help but look for the truth. That's our job as human beings. We, we need to know what's true. We need something that is objectively true. And by that, I don't mean subject object. I don't mean because I can see it and touch it. I mean, because it's true whether I believe it or not. That's what it means to be objective. It is the truth and it will always be the truth and it does not depend on me believing it, right? But this power of us to believe literally affects our lives. It creates everything we, we're doing, not by manifesting, in the way most people think of it. Most people think of it, I'm going to hold a particular thought or a particular energy vibration, <clears throat> right? And that's going to bring the thing out of the universe. It doesn't work that way. The, the focus of attention, um, 
need both hands to express this. <laughs> the, your, your focus of attention creates the boundary in which your, your world is perceived, right? So I'm looking around, I see all sorts of things. Something gets my attention, I zoom in and I don't see this anymore. Now, the more I focus my attention on one spot, the more vivid and large it becomes, right? It literally pushes everything else out and what's there now becomes much larger. We will sometimes then have experiences where we'll notice things we didn't notice before and we'll call that a manifestation. Oh, it just came out of nowhere. No, it's been there the whole time. It, we didn't see it simply because of, because of the, the constriction of our perception. Manifestation and perception are one and the same. There is no, nothing is being newly created in the universe. <laughs> you are simply seeing what, let's put it this way. Look at this as a complete field of potential. And what, wherever your attention focuses, that begins to develop. It begins to come into existence. The word ex ex existence derives from the, the Latin word extestere which means to set forth, to bring forward, right? And based on our particular attitudes and beliefs, and most importantly, identity, that will determine what moves forward. In that sense, it's a manifestation. It is coming into existence. It's not something that pre-existed, but the potential for everything is here. Right? This is why I emphasize to not emphasize manifestation. So no, I don't manifest. I don't set intentions for, for an, any kind of day. I don't need to because the day will always reflect the deepest image I hold of myself. That is what drives the beliefs, which drives perception, which drives attention, which drives interest. The whole mechanism is dri driven by how I see myself, which is why I always am bringing people's attention back to your self-image. How do you see yourself? Who are you? In the in the in in the deeper question. So getting back to the whole new age spirituality, it really started to explode um, around the end of the 19th century. So the last half of the 1800s up into the 1900s, there was just an explosion of spiritualism and all sorts of the new thought movement started uh, at, at, at that point. There was the metaphysics. Uh, uh, hypnosis came in, came into came into existence. You had the transcendentalist uh, uh, club. You know Thoreau and and um, and Whitman and and several others. Um, so there was a whole different state of mind that was emerging, and it didn't really have any anchor, right? Because the anchor that it had before was gone. The church was gone, right? Its influence had already, uh, it, it had, was no longer an influence on the intellectual life. It still had control here and still does on, on, uh, on those who aren't very well, uh, well educated. Um, but as time went on, um, this human need to have something very solid and dependable and real and true um, ended up falling into the hands of the scientists and materialism and objective reality and measurement and weight and all that sort of stuff. So that anything that cannot be weighed and measured is regarded as false. Right? But this whole other area was trying, is still trying to find something. Actually, I could go into this forever, but you kind of dance in between. Okay, so now quantum theory says I can manifest what I want. So you see, it's still trying to find this objective basis on which it can say this is true. And, and new age spirituality is just all sorts of different ideas and concepts and attitudes that have developed that apparent seem to kind of work as everything does if you believe in it but doesn't have that foundation, so it's highly unstable. This is why I've dedicated my life to teaching what that foundation is. <laughs> and that foundation is very simple. It's not out there, it's here. But it's not my subjective view of myself. It is not my self-image that is the foundation of the truth that does not change. The truth is true whether I believe it or not. The truth of me is true whether I believe it or not. And so the purpose of life is to simply discover who that is. When you do, you have the truth that is true, whether it is believed or not. You have found your way back home. And now you can see 
the validity, what is valid about the sciences and materialism and the like, what is not, right? Because they, it is a closed system. They cannot, they cannot accommodate consciousness, so they explain it away, right? And on, on, on the other hand, all the, you know, the plethora of different religious views and new age spirituality and, and, and the like that have grown up to try to find that. So we get things like astrology making a resurgent, a resurgence understood you know, as your horoscope in the newspaper for crying out, for crying out loud, <laughs> right? Or these ideas of the, the lion's gate or 5D, right? And aliens. All of this for us looking for some stable place to stand. And what's unique about our day and time is prior to this, we've just developed another culture, another kind of story that we then all kind of fell into. So we had an agreement that lasted for a while. Over the last three, 400 years, those stories don't last as long as they used to. They used to last for 100 years, 500 years, 1,000 years, right? The Roman Empire was 1,800 years, 1,200 years, something like that. A story. That's all it was, a story that perpetuated. You notice how they're falling apart faster and faster and faster. And now, in our age of marketing, those stories are being created by the moment. You get 100 of them every day. Of course, we're totally, right? Where's the truth? And this is what has, what's different about this time is it's not just going to be another story. It's going to be the truth. It's going to be the, the final curtain is the realization of who you really are. And then all of this will be put to rest. Whatever is value, valuable in the insights that were gleaned by all of these things that have, gone, that have, have transpired, um, they'll they'll be they'll be taken they'll be used but they'll now you be used in the context of the depth of understanding of who you really are and th these will now become tools in the hands of the master and the master is you <laughs> yes long-winded answer but i i thought it was something that deserved um, a little bit more intention so attention and intention so <laughs> Thank you all, and um, thank you for that question, and until later.